Hello, everybody. I am pleased to say that we have a fantastic guest today for our podcast, which is just as in its infancy. We started this year to broaden the uh, scope of CFEST. And our guest today is Sean McNulty from New York. Thank you so much for joining us. He is a writer and media maverick. I tried to write your bio. It's impossible because there's just <laughs> so much stuff. Emmy winning, content producer, creator of short video segments on popular culture, podcast producer, journalist, host, creator of marketing campaigns. His daily podcast, which I've become like addicted to, is a newsletter called The Wake Up, uh, and it's called A Cult Favorite. And that's what Janice Mean mentioned when she recruited you. And it's an aggregator, a roundup of entertainment industry business news from relevant media outlets, all of them. How can you read all of them? I don't know on a daily basis. So the wake up is primarily aimed to quote you at industry executives. You know, you know, maybe I'm not exactly in that category, but let's say I am for, for right now. <laughs> and the news is delivered as an attractive and for me, addictive package. Uh, a perfect pairing for the first cup of coffee at daybreak. And I'm a coffee fanatic. So there you go. <laughs> and we, you were a DJ in college. You talk very fast. I've listened to you on some other. Uh, I, I do. Podcasts. I'll try. Yeah. I'll try and keep it a little to a reasonable level, but I warning in advance. Yes. Very good. Very good. Fair enough. And, uh, but you do a lot of work. First of all, you really scan a whole lot of outlets. So, is there a, um, a system to that madness that you can share with the rest of us mortals to tell us because there's so much to know and uh, it's a rabbit hole. I mean, so how do you do that? Because you really present that it's, it's you know, like we can uh, absorb that and we can understand. Anyway, so how do you do that? What's the secret to your uh, daily output? <laughs> it depends on the day, really. Uh, you know, it, a lot of it's, you know, there are, of course, three main trades in Hollywood. Uh, so that that's the core of it, certainly. But, you know, all three report 80% of the same news, but 20% only goes in one, you know, so you it's a really a matter of just it's it's pure just scanning and then uh, filtering is honestly the biggest thing. It, it, and you're right, it is a lot of work. There's no shortcut to it. Mm -hmm. It's just not in my opinion, very, you know, user friendly to the targeted audience, where if you want to know everything that's, you know, kind of pertinent, one source is not going to give that to you, or one trade source is not going to give that to you. So that's job number one, that's the majority of it. That's, you know, that's primarily TV deal news, movie deal news, mm -hmm. other, you know, it's very much I'll call it Hollywood news, but more in the business side, not in celebrity gossip and things like that, obviously. Right. Uh, then, you know, there's other industry stuff. So things, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, uh, you know, kind of the, the main popular things that are out there, you know, uh, other emails filter through some are more tech focused that I don't need a lot of it, but I'll be like, oh, that's one item from that, that I'll pull here for the, again, entertainment and media focused audience that, you know, they don't need to know the other eight things in the tech audience email, but that one thing from there, I'll pull over, you know, things like that. So it's a lot of scanning a little bit wider of a net to other not to say industries, but a little bit outside of the core of streaming TV and film to bring in other things that like, oh, you should know about this, even things like sports, which is what most people watch, even in, you yes. know, in, in Hollywood, people want to think it's all about scripted television. But if you want to look at the numbers, it's the World NFL. Cup. Yeah, World Cup. Exactly. It is not, uh, you know, the, the scripted, it's not the White Lotus as much as Hollywood would, would want you to believe that. So, which is very important for understanding how decisions are made at these companies that have these rights and understanding, you know, so even if people are into those kinds of topics, I try and pull those things that are pertinent, you know, but also tell you why, why I'm doing that or why you should pay attention to this versus giving you all the sports news, which you do not need or do not want, but it's with that filter. So it's just uh, reading a lot of newsletter sites uh, and aggregating in the best way that, you know, having, again, my background is as an executive, not a journalist. So I, not that I know what every executive needs to know, but it's a little bit of like, I know what they don't need to know or what's not going to help their job or what they're going to get, you know, uh, feel bad about if they don't know about something, you know, that kind of filter to it, where I know what that conversation is inside most of my careers at HBO, you know, inside of a media conglomerate, what those executive conversations are and what would be helpful, you know, to someone in, the, in that situation. Uh, what kind of comments do you get? What kind of comments? Uh, I mean, like, uh, like, uh, like responses? Like a phone call. Oh, um, uh, hold the line for the president of Warner Brothers. So do you <laughs> Yeah, uh, that one hasn't come in yet, uh, oddly enough. Uh, it's, you know what? It's really, 
uh, a journey. And there's no, I have no, it's been very, you know, thankfully rather positive. I don't get too much on outside of maybe I, I do spell some names wrong on occasion, which I always apologize for and correct. Um, but people have been very, you know, just, uh, just a lot of positive, just, uh, you know, uh, un, un, unprompted, you know, notes just saying they like what they like it. And, you know, uh, occasionally have a question for me to maybe, expand upon something or you know things like that but um and then yeah some other executives and things will reach out so it's a mix of people and people who to your point are nothing to do with hollywood or the media business who just like you know so it's a and i, I don't it was, again it wasn't built you know it wasn't my intention for that but that's been kind of the fun of doing it is kind of finding out oh this does have whatever whatever voice or presentation that i'm doing is still an entertaining presentation of the information where you don't have to know you know, the, it's not as dry or as, you know, I try to explain things in a way that, well, you may not be an expert in this, but here's kind of the gist of what this means kind of thing. So it's been a wide variety. It's great. Well, thank you. Um, uh, well, I, I'm, you know, I really would uh, like sometimes to be the fly on the wall and see how that all happens. But uh, uh, <laughs> It's but, much less know. glamorous than you think, Vera. I <laughs> oh, right I now. know. It's always like, you know, <laughs> isn't it the truth? Yeah. So, um, well, the, you know, we've been reading so much about the scary news about the, um, you know, theaters really struggling and the box office that, you know, for Top Gun and for uh, Avatar is promising. Maybe for Babylon, we don't know. But, you know, but there's really few and far between movies that make money. And so everybody's trying to see what to do. And then streaming is also not making as much money as people. And it's very expensive to do. It's not, you know, a cheap thing. Sure. So they try to consolidate. Some people have gone. Some executives have gone, most famously at Disney. So um, uh, any thoughts on what's up in 2023? Um, I also... Just a little, you know, side note, I read about the Academy um, sort of cutting short their deal with ABC to, to uh, 2028 um, and also with Dolby. Uh, 2028 is important for LA because it's the Olympic year. Do you sure. see any, you know, sort of like overlapping there with this because it's going to be a big platform for everybody? Uh, in terms of the, I'll start with the Oscars first. I, you know, that's more of the TV deal and the bigger problem there that, is going to come up is that they signed a, a you know a very long term deal with ABC back in the mid 2010s which expires in 2028 so at a rate that's not going to be renewed anywhere near what they're being paid now because the ratings have just not come back and you know and we'll see maybe you know again we're coming this this year is probably the first arguably full year of a theatrical product and you're going to have a lot of movies that were in theaters and big i mean coda was great but it was a, a niche art house you know, what we call your art house specialty biz yeah. film, great movie, but not like, you know, the, there weren't these big, uh, it wasn't Top Gun being nominated. It wasn't, you know, the big ones this year are going to be films that most people have probably heard of and seen and, you know, uh, which may engage an audience. It may not. Uh, so the, the Oscars just kind of match their, their location agreement with this, with the theater to their TV deal, because they know there's going to be a reset in 2028 mm -hmm. or after 2028 because the tv deal is not you know maybe it goes to streaming maybe you know who knows where the oscar show is going to go if their audience levels don't come back to 20 million i mean they you know they've been in i think it was about 14 million last year we'll see what it gets to which is you know fine but not for the price that abc is paying them no. for the for the rights for the no, show they, so yeah they bounced back i think it was 16 million which was a little bit better but not at, you know at the I mean, level it, that it used to be it's kind of you know right. down so right. the um well, where does it leave? Uh, it's not just the, uh, the the international cinema is very much in the same uh, in say in the same place as the American independent movies, which we you, you know love absolutely adore you know those people because that's you know we we all grew up on those movies and we love them and we don't want them to disappear. So it's it's you know I guess it would be called maybe mid range, but if you have Avatar that's almost five hundred million dollars, you know what is the mid mid range? You know it's not hundred right. million that you know allegedly Babylon cost. So something that's three, four, five million or less. What happens with the? I mean, you know, the if there's no audience, uh, do you see any? Because how can industry sustain itself? Only. You know, is it really all going to streaming? That's that's our future. Um, I mean, the specialty this excuse me, the specialty market, which you know, what it's indie biz, call it what you want, uh, yeah. our art house, all the same term here. Um, 
look, it's challenged. Uh, it was never that great. If you know, going back of like, it was, you know, there's this kind of, Oh, it was awesome. Like it was awesome in like 1999. Like, you know, this, everybody has this era of golden independent cinema and yes. like of the Soderbergh's and the Tarantino. I'm like, yeah, that was 20 years ago. You know, the 2010s wasn't exact. you know, there are always hits, you know, and misses and as Richard Rushfield who writes, uh, started the Ankler and he wrote about this recently, like, you know, there are always these big misses every year. You just forget about them all the time. And maybe there's some yeah. more now. And it's, and look, it is challenged it's more than, you know, people aren't coming back in the numbers they were at before. There's no argument about it, but it doesn't mean that it's dead. Like, as he said, you know, a dead market doesn't produce hits. And the Banshees have been a Sharon, which you would on paper not say that's the film that's going to make 20, over $20 million worldwide. It's a story of, it's a great movie. It's a set in the Irish countryside and, you know, in 19 or 1900s and, you know, about two guys and one guy's, you know, chopping his fingers off. So, you know, uh, but that did very well. And, you know, it's just the films that, that didn't make it this year, didn't, you know, hit, were maybe never going to, that wouldn't have in 2017 or 2007, you know, not every film is destined to make some money. So that's one thing about the the specialty market to kind of keep in mind and but it is daunting but it may go back to more and i think there are some models reverting back to a little bit of the way that it was where the thing with independent cinema was you get it privately financed you would you know sell it to a u.s distributor hopefully because as you said that is kind of the uh, exactly the goal or the the first market you want to be in is in america and then yeah there's a lot of other sales are based off of your american sale so and then you go to you know con or you go to other you know markets throughout the year and you sell the rights by country to other people uh to other distributors um so it, you know and then you make your money back eventually you know whatever that might be so it may go back a bit to that streaming money is still there um you know i don't think their appetite for that kind of film is necessarily as big as it probably was a couple of years ago to be frank with you we'll see what sundance bores out this year uh in terms of purchases and things like that but but they also have like you know what more than twenty thousand submissions so it's very hard to you know to cut through the clutter of so many movies i mean there are many more movies now than audiences almost i mean sure. uh, you know and uh, I, anyway so the um i wanted also to ask you your thoughts on the media because i know that there's a, a you know, more online uh, media outlets and the, that's been supplanting the print. And I've, of course, been reading about the Washington Post yeah. <laughs> you know, sorrows yeah. lately. Uh, but, you know, there's the Ankler, there is Puck, there is the rap and the rap pro that's a deadline. That's, you know, so we're all receive so many things in our inbox. Um, and then the bloggers, uh, you know, the movie bloggers and people who, and like, you know, as you said, with the Ankler, you know, Richard Rushfield, you know, started that. And now there's uh, quite a few of you that joined. And Janice Main, who was previously with The Hollywood Reporter. So um, how do you see the media uh, landscape uh, online and uh, um, shorter and sweeter, you know, news segments vis-a-vis uh, -vis the print? Um, are we all going to see print slowly dying. I mean, it's kind of, to me, mimics the situation with theaters and the streaming. Yeah, I don't think print is, uh, sorry, I think print is in a more of a dire uh, straight because it's just the medium people just don't want to buy anymore. You know, I think as, you, as we you know, kind of alluded to, people still love movies. It's whether you watch it at home or in a theater. It's mm -hmm. not that, oh, people don't like movies anymore. I mean, no, they still do. It's just that where they see them has shifted. Right. And this is the same thing. It's the analogy is, you know, it used to be in print and, you know, in a daily thing and, and just fewer people want to do that experience because the nature of what it is, is, you know, it's now it's present. It's not, you know, maybe a magazine has a little more leeway in that sense, but a, a newspaper doesn't, you know, uh, is really tough where, yeah, at the times, the New York times will still make a newspaper for you know, people still love a Sunday paper. There's things like that, you know, that'll exist, but it's not, a, it's not a growth business by, by any means. And they've thankfully shifted away from that at the right time. So they're not as dependent upon it where the things like Washington post maybe still a little more reliant upon that and are getting a little more caught, um, but you know, it's really, it's technology like anything else has enabled people to, you know, create these new online digital brands and where before you'd have to be a columnist at a, a, the USA today or whatever it was. And that would be what Richard would have done, or even myself would have done. I'd be printing a daily column or, you know, whatever you want right. to call it, where now it's just this new medium where things like Substack or newsletter things, which is a direct 
connection with your audience. You know, it's not based on Facebook. It's not based on social media mm-hmm. platforms, which was kind of David Gore back in the late 2010s. And everybody's like, oh, I can't rely on this because they changed the algorithm and my business just went up in smoke. Mm-hmm. So everybody kind of learned that the hard way. Uh, even the publications did who were you know, relying on Facebook for news distribution. And when they cut that program, oh, well, there goes all, you know, that's what they, they get caught. So it's like, you can't rely on these things that the people were trying to pivot to. Uh, you know, the famous pivot to video was also a, a wash for most of these because you don't want it to, it's the news. You don't necessarily want to watch it or, and people who can write can't necessarily make good video. My you know, my background's at HBO. It's like, it's very tough and it's very costly. Uh, oh, yeah. So that was the other kind of mistake or, or move. And I think, you know, newsletters are back. The publication is back in a sense. Print is um, clearly going to be, it is what it is. And, you know, it's like more yeah. like dial up internet. It's probably my bigger, my bit. like it still exists for some people, but it's not going to be a growth business. So um, it's fun. It's exciting though. Well, let's talk about the money. Uh, there are some of the um, like Substack and, and the Ankler and also uh, Puck. They're, you know, subscription based, uh, the Red Pro also. Uh, even Variety Intelligencer would offer, you know, like you kind of can see the news and they say, oh, this is, you know, like the hook. So would you like to subscribe? Right. So uh, one um, a stream of revenue, I guess, is coming from subscription. Not that I know much about it because we have uh, we are nonprofit, so we offer our information for free. Uh, but the other uh, revenue stream, I guess, would be advertising. Uh, so which of these two main, you know, the like ad based and there's also some now going back maybe in streaming and Netflix is going to uh, have the ad based and there's also the fast uh, model. Sure. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about it just to kind of uh, um, unpack that very briefly and uh, on, a, on, a, on a basic level for our uh, audiences? Sure. I mean, anything with a subscription on it, so whether that be the Ankler or Puck or Netflix, is there, you know, they add advertising into it is not the core revenue. Obviously, it can grow and it's, it's it, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, you know, runway ahead for it, but the primary revenue basis is the subscription. That's what you're, you know, uh, kind of living and dying on where... And the traditional, back to go back to our print friends, it was always the newspaper was almost the loss leader for the advertising where, yes, you had a subscription to the New York Times, but they made a lot more money off of those one page ads they sold in the New York Times. So it's a bit of the reverse of of the traditional sense of what how we probably view this model. Um, And now once you have the subscription, there's, you know, then it's like, well, let's add this on top. And if it's going to grow, great. But, you know, you're not reliant upon it. And when you hit these rough patches like we're in right now where the ad market's pulling back, you're not, you know, it's not, the, the, the sky isn't falling where, you know, even if you look at the New York Times right now is doing very well, even as, amid, among a time where advertisers are being pulled back. And that's the problem with a lot of publishers you're seeing back to that news publishing conversation is that they are very reliant upon advertising. And when that gets pulled, you know, we've seen it before 2008, 2002, you know, it's, and this is a pretty harsh one in a sense, and it's just leaner times in general than before. So that's where it really gets to hurt the, the, um, the model, but um, for places like, you know, Netflix, you know, it's funny and Disney plus just, you know, launched their ad tier as well uh, this month here in December, you know, it's an add on business. I don't Netflix, even, you know, for all the stuff that was written about, Netflix's entry into the the, the ad business. Uh, and even they last last week, my weeks get a little blurry sometimes. I saw them, I apologize, but I think it was last week. Uh, you know, essentially the news is coming out not from Netflix, but a report in Digiday saying, you know, they're not hitting their metrics for what they promised, you know, audience delivery because not enough people are, you know, wa- or not as many people watched or took the ad tier as they even, you know, uh, projected internally. So it's going to be a little add on business for Netflix for a while. It's uh, th- their core is still that main, you know, 220 million people who pay for yeah. a subscription. So if 2 million people do the ad tier, sure, it's fine, you know, but they're probably also they, you know, the, the question with Netflix is, or they don't like the, you don't want to happen is that people paying you $15 a month downgrading to $7 a month. This is a US prices, of course, right. and kind of in Europe too, but because those people, if they're light users, they're not going to make the ad revenue back to get to $15 a month, but that you're earning on the subscription. So 
that's the the tricky part is people downgrading from you know the upper right. tiers to seven dollars and not watching the volume maybe they're light users like myself i don't watch a lot of netflix i don't you know i'm fine to watch a couple of ads when i do and then they're not going to make the money back selling me the ads because i'm not i have to watch stuff for, the, for the money to come in yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's the trickier part but they're hoping the seven dollars brings just more people in who were never watching before or were using their friends account or that's which they're well, probably you know. would make up for it maybe so yeah yeah, yeah. it's a tricky tricky math but we'll yeah. see uh, so what do you think of, uh, uh, there's, you know, the, the merger mania in town here with the, ad, you know, talent agencies and then, you know, different, of course, Fox and Disney, um, but as also um, like Penske Media that owns 50% uh, stake in uh, uh, South by Southwest. And, you know, they, they have also launched um, LA3C, the film festival that just, uh, so they're getting into our, our business, <laughs> but they're very cleverly combining music, which I think is a really terrific business to be in better than, you know, the movies right. and then, you know, sports, I guess. Uh, but there's also a big, um, you know, I know that you mentioned in that, um, uh, when you were having the interview with Austin Schlesinger at the Greedy and Curious, that you said that you like to address the elephant in the room. So I like that, you know, like, you know, where's my elephant here that I'm going to ask you about? So I came up with a, a semi-elephant here, which is the, okay. the gaming industry. That's gaming. bigger than anything else. I mean, the, the, the game and the concentration of talent also. Yeah, I'm not a you know um, somebody who's playing games, but I know that you know it requires terrific talent to create any game. I mean, really, and a lot of talent, a lot of different people. So, uh, do you ever write? You know, maybe I missed it that you didn't write about the gaming industry and what's happening there because it's such a big, it's bigger business than ours, isn't it? I mean, it's certainly by I mean, even the deal for Microsoft, you know, uh, buying Blizzard Activision is, a, you know, a 70 or 69 billion dollar deal, which, you know, uh, Fox buying Disney was 71 billion. So it's certainly, you know, like that's that's up there, you know, in terms of the size of these companies. And that's that's one of the top three, you know, yeah. Activision Blizzard is a top three company, certainly. And Fox was a top you know, studio, mm -hmm. of course. Um, yeah, gaming, I mean, like gaming and social media kind of fall in that same category of like, that's back to the time usage theory of yeah. you're competing for, you know, this is kind of what Reed Hastings has alluded to a bit and why they're getting into gaming. The other Netflix, you know, kind of pivot their third, quote unquote, the third leg of their business model now is, uh, is gaming according to them. Um, but it's, uh, it is a different set of, it's a different culture. Um, number one. Uh, so people who work in gaming don't work in Hollywood and vice versa, you know, like in movies and TV filmmakers are not making video games, you know, and TikTok stars are not movie stars. And even though it was TikTok's uh, taking a lot of, you know, a lot of time, it's a different business model. It's a different, you know, it's, the economics are much different. You know, the amount of money that goes into developing a game is much, I mean, you think a movie, you think, you know, a hundred million or whatever for Babylon's a lot, like that's nothing for a call of duty. Like that's, you know, that, endeavors a lot bigger so it's just there's not a lot of scale there's not a lot of similarities across these businesses other than it's an you know they're all looking for your attention yes. uh so that's probably the one common denom denominator that why people think they should be grouped together but from a, a business operating point of view those executives need to know something entirely they don't need to know what brad pitt's next movie is you know that's not something that the gaming industry is worried about, you know or needs to be concerned about and the talent, as you say, too, is way different in that it's mostly coders and, you know, these are computer people. They're not, you know, they're creative, but they're designers and they're, you know, it's just not like a, there's no, I mean, there are probably some writers and things, but it's not, the writer isn't, isn't driving the gaming industry. The writer is driving, you know, TV and film and a certain, that's where all things start. So, and TikTok is a whole different thing where you're a performer and that's, that's a performing thing, you know, that's all video. So anyway, that's kind of how, how and why I don't, you know, cause who, who, who's the audience you're serving. And that's really the question that I, you know, the, you have to make your, you have to make a decision. You have to have a filter of some sort. Otherwise you're just throwing everything at the audience. And that that's the lot. That's right. why I created what I do in a certain way. Right. But, you know, going back to writers uh, that you mentioned, I mean, we have the, the writers are complaining. I mean, there's a strike uh, uh, again, you know, in a, in a short period of a few years, they want to be on strike again. And so they feel um, squeezed and that it's harder for them to make money. And it does take a lot of time uh, writing. I mean, seriously, writing anything, you know, even uh, well, 
and, and but especially writing I mean good writers it it takes time and they have to be able to you know have make a living so um so what do you think that you know is do you see any any shift that's coming in in how because we can't lose you know that writing contingent that we have a uh, really talented people who are able to come in into a writer's room and save the show and you know like reinvent them the, you know I have great respect for writers because I know how hard it is to write anything <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know the uh, because I do a lot of writing myself and uh, I'm not in any way comparing myself to them but I respect them and and understand the uh you know the hours and days and, and years and knowledge that goes into it uh so where do you see the writers because you know everything else is so much about you know the suits <laughs> as we like to call them in the uh, you know the I understand their point of view as well because they they have to justify to their investors and so on but I think it all starts with writers, really. It starts on the page. It always starts on the page. So uh, with a looming possibility, a looming strike and uh, uh, and writers making, you know, having it harder. Uh, how do you think that, you know, the Hollywood will resolve this? Because they have to keep talented people. They can't. I mean, the movie has to be written. The script has to be written and rewritten many times. Right. Yeah. And we just, uh, Nicole Laporte at the Ankle just did a whole, you know, uh, thing called the squeeze on writers and diving into this very topic. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's really more TV than film. I think that, you know, from the gist of it, um, cause film still, you do get rewrite work. You still can sell script, you know, it's uh, that you maybe do need to, you know, as Nicole was saying, you know, attach talent more to your work than before, where the idea doesn't sell maybe as much as it used to in film mm -hmm. because you're not, they're just not making, you know, unless it's attached to a piece of IP, there there are fewer and fewer Babylons in the world out there, whatever, you know, however you want to go with it. Uh, so that's the harder part for the for the film writer, but the work is still there and the and the money is still there. The problem on TV is really more of a, a I mean, it's a bit of a work problem, but more of a money problem than that. And before, you know, you were network television was a very writer friendly compensation yeah. model where you got a per episode, you get some mid-level to upper level will get overall deals which would be you know in the millions of you know depends upon how what how in demand you are but you know a nice way to kind of buy the time between your shows things like that and you got residuals that actually meant something so when it was re-aired when it re-aired not only in the u.s but when it was sold to poland when it was sold to japan you know you got uh, you know not a, but that stuff adds up over time and that doesn't happen in streaming now it's a one-time check so that's what needs to probably be you know re recalibrated so the negotiations you're saying you know, the writers guild has to their deal with the studios and streamers is up for renewal uh in the spring yeah. i think it's april or may um so that's what's going to happen and you know but the thing i haven't heard is you know what are you asking for and it's the, you know when you don't have the streaming information you know how do you what's the what's a compensation model to kind of mimic that and no one's come yeah. up with a, a, a or that i've seen a formula for saying, hey, we need to put it more back this way versus the one-time check. Um, and it's a lot of people, you know, it's also, look, industry's changed, certainly. Broadcast television residuals were not around, you know, for many, you know, and they're really so like every era has their own caveats in terms of what the business model is. So new people, new writers in the business, are just they just know this reality. They don't know a world where NBC, ABC, and CBS, and Fox were your main revenue sources, and Friends was a yeah. phenomenon. You know, they didn't grow up in any of this stuff. They grew up with what you know, streaming shows, which this is why you pay them. And oh, I have to make this much, you know, do this much work. So it's just people who have been around a little bit longer and have built a career on it and built their lives around this financial model that that's where that's getting tougher because the money's yeah. not coming in. And when you built a life like that and a career like that to pivot into doing as you said, writing's tough and writing three shows a year because that's the volume you have to put out there now and not do one really good show or whatever, you know, whatever that may take that time to maybe craft something a little bit longer that, you know, not, it's not all ideas, you know, happen to you in an instant. It may take a while. It could be so. a competition to you with another, you know, like a morning, <laughs> you know, news slider or something. That's a whole different, you know, ball game and it's not easy. It's not easy. That's also its own, its own uh, uh, format that, that not everybody can do. Um, but uh, uh, how do you view social media? How do you use it? Um, and I'm not going to get into, you know, fake news. It's like, um, it's old news. Uh, 
but yeah. you know but it's really that there's just so much you know different uh, uh bits of truth and bits of not truth uh leaving the truth uh, out of this uh but information you know you have half of something but you don't see the whole context and what i appreciated in uh the ankler and uh, puck and other resources is that yes it's a short form but it really gives the gist of what and then if i want to i can really dig into more and find out the information that i need but it really does uh which i know how hard that is uh to you know package that in a, in a short yeah. segment uh so uh you know so social media uh, that has that is all over the place and everybody posts everything um without impunity so uh so how uh, do you view that and to what degree are you even concerned about it um and do you use it how do you use it uh social media and uh, um you know you have your trusted sources you know so your so tell us a little bit about that yeah, I mean, trusted sources is a good word. I think you nailed that on the head for me. Uh, so to answer your question, I really don't use social media much at all. Um, I mean, Instagram is probably what I'll check every once in a while, but I haven't looked at my Facebook account in four months, uh, nor do I really plan to. Uh, Twitter has now turned into whatever that's going to be. I'm not going to get into that conversation either, but you know, that can also just you know, you're, for me, the amount of information that's valuable you glean out of for your time you invest in that is just not, because you're reading the same information. Everybody's just tweeting about the same thing. I'm like, I'm not learning anything new here. Yeah. I'm just, or someone's opinion, which I don't, who maybe I don't even know or whatever, you know, I trusted sources. Is this a valid source? And that's the real key that I, you know, we hope is never lost in society is these institutions, for lack of a better term, who are trusted and are, you know, is are real sources of news. You may not like the news, you may not, but you know, uh, and every look, they're everybody's a human. You're going to be writing something. Okay, I'm, you know, there's one, but this one word is did was you didn't like this adjective or something. You know, you, you can't get bent out of stuff about that, bent out of shape about that stuff. It's more uh, having these places which are just trusted sources, and whether that's a person or whether you know, sometimes it, maybe it's evolved more into now where what we're doing or other, you know, newsletters are doing or a company called semaphores out there are doing a new, a new thing as well with Ben Smith, you know, so it's just, you know, whether Lucas Shaw at Bloomberg, it's like, okay, you get to know the people in the, but it's part of an organization that has a track record of delivering you news that has proven out to be true and is not full of, at this point, you can kind of see through what's puffery and what's, you know, as you said, you can have somebody can write, you know, 3000 words and they really were saying two sentences. They just felt the need to write 3000 words. And, yes. you know, uh, so it's, that's a, that's not a great news source uh, to be, it's like, that's not helpful. And that's kind of what I'm doing a bit is to like, Oh, let me, I do take the time to try and find out, is there something in this or not? And if there is, I'll bring it over. And if you, as you said, if you do want to go in by all means, you know, here's the link. And I put links to everything I do and everything I, I you know, include in there. Yes. I know. That's great. It's really I mean, you know, it, it, it gives me the, the, the bigger picture and I kind of know, okay, I know where I am today, you know, like <laughs> with, the, with the wake up, uh, uh, you know, to just to add a few more things. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, and By I appreciate way. that you're uh, talking to to me. Uh, you have, um, uh, from what I have seen and researched uh, um, uh, a little bit, that you have a library of things that you have done. So we hear very often how people are able to use the library of those short segments that you have produced, the interviews that you have produced, uh, the things that you did for Cinemax, the things you did for HBO, the marketing campaigns. And, you know, it's like, so, it, so I'm sure you have a whole library, I don't know how else to call it, of things that you have created, that you produced, that you put together. Do you see the, um, you know, any type of syndication uh, for somebody like you to do the things that you've already done and repackage that is there something just as a model you know uh, not necessarily for anything specific but do you see that uh somebody in your position could down the road uh have the, the content that the the um uh, the wealth of content that you have created syndicated in some way and then repurpose it and uh, have it um in a, in a different format, different package, like, you know, oh, hey, you know, this is the 30th anniversary of, uh, I don't know, Julia Roberts and Tom Hanks uh, or something that you had that little segment with them. Uh, 
you know, things like that, pop culture, because people do go back to the, these are known entities, these are name uh, um, actors and, and uh, people in Hollywood. So anyway, so just syndication and repurposing. Sure. I mean, what I did, I mean, I'll be up front, you know, HBO owns whatever I've done, you know, so I own, I own nothing to be clear about that. So if my personally, that's not a go for me. Does it hold value for HBO? Um, that, you know, the person who paid for all this, you know, the, the budgets I was producing, I but I don't, right. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't my money. So it's their money. Um, yeah, there's, you know, there's a bit of that. I mean, you know, YouTube is a bit supplanted this where everything of that of a pop culture nature is out there. So, uh, you know, if someone to your point was doing a retrospective of something and like, oh, this would be a great thing to include in that, that's fine. It's not a big market and a lot of money involved in that. Uh, and again, pop culture or movies and TV are so ephemeral in that most of it has no very little return value to something. Uh, there's a few things that might, but your hit to miss ratio on having a, a library of that elk with pop culture content you know, outside of a few clips in someone else's documentary at some point where you might get paid for something, you know, for usage in a, in a different thing, a retrospective, as you said, or something like that. But as someone, as the content itself being sold not, somewhere mm -hmm. to watch, you are not going to watch an interview about a movie, you know, 30, 20 years later, you know, like a 30, 50 minute special with the cast. It's a very niche market. You know, where would it go these days? I mean, you mentioned fast services before, which we didn't really get into too much, but these free ad supported streaming services, which are Pluto, Tubi, uh, Roku channel, things like that. They're populating with this kind of material. So that's like, I would say no, but I'm like, yeah, for a movie channel that needs interstitial content, you know, or short form content to kind of fill out one of their movie channels or things like right. that. Yeah, you probably, HBO could probably, if, you know, Warner Brothers Discovery is going to launch their own fast service next year in 2023. That might have value for those movie channels. So, you know, you never know. Certainly, is it a lot of value? No, but it's, you know, it's a little, a little bit along those lines, along those, of that having just pop culture interview based content in that sense. Yeah. Well, we had, um, you know, uh, among other things at our festival, we have an accelerator platform for emerging filmmakers and people working on projects and development. So one of the things that we always have writers, producers, um, entertainment attorneys, uh, uh, distributors and producers who talk about, you know, like how to perfect your pitch and present your project. Um, but one of the things that this year uh, we talked about a lot was IP. So that people, you know, especially those that are writing, pro, you know, they they are the writers. They they you know. So how to? So they said, well, you know, if you just write a script, or even if you register and uh, you make a movie, but you need to have like a book still. So we're kind of going back. Oh, I have to have a book, you know, in order to. Let's <laughs> yeah. well, all this book again, Vera. That's yeah. what I say. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. Yeah. Like so there was a bit this big discussion. So what is really IP, which is intellectual property for those who are not familiar with the with the acronym, some are not, believe it or not. Um, so what would be, you know, the um, uh, for you, uh, you know, so people who paid you before to do things for them, these segments, they own it. You don't, you know, what is your IP? Are you even interested in that, uh, owning something that you could? No, I mean, IP is, you know, that's really a scripted realm. Uh, you're talking IP, you're going to be, yeah, it's pretty basic. You're going to either be a comic book, uh, of course, which is pretty much DC or Marvel at this point, um, or things like Dark Horse or other, you know, smaller players, but that's that. Or you've written a book, as you said, that's a unique IP, original idea. Uh, unless it's a biography, then the life person has life rights. So there's a different, different case in that, in that regard. Um, and then you're writing a, you know, as I said, an original, you know, film idea. I mean, a, a friend of mine wrote the movie Pitch Perfect, you know, or did the book, uh, that, that Pitch Perfect is based on, you know, and he has this, you know, I don't know, a lot, you know, most of that ownership goes to Universal Pictures, not to the, you know, the right. writers. So if, yeah, if you're right. talking to, if you're talking to writers and, you know, in these workshops, in these areas, like you want to own or, as much as you can in the, in the process, maintain ownership of whatever you can. Uh, that's usually hard for someone without a track record, um, without leverage in a deal where this, if somebody buying it wants to be able to do whatever they want with it. So they can do the spinoff. They can do the 10, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, remember, Sylvester Stallone doesn't own Rocky. Like, you know, like that's, I mean, as, as much as there's a lot behind that, but like even something you think, oh my God, it's like you associate it with him. He doesn't own the property, you know, it's, yeah. it's a, so it's, it's a tough thing to, it's a tough thing to get in negotiation. It's a tough thing to hold on to. Um, but creating it is really, you know, it's having that idea and the person who even on TV shows, CSI, the creator of CSI owns CSI, you know, or whatever it might be, and they can sell it or license it or whatever it might be. 
Um, but even Jerry Bruckheimer is a producer on that. So, you know, there's also, there's also how much do you own of something where you're not going to own your idea a hundred percent, but if you can maintain a percentage, that's a valuable part because that's your best bet as a writer and anything is, you know, you're not going to own the thing outright unless you're Quentin Tarantino, which, you know, not going to happen. Right. Maybe, you know. But... <laughs> oh, we won't say that. We'll say yeah, it. Right. Don't be, it's it possible. might happen. Everything, but, anything know, everything is possible. possible. Yeah. But I wouldn't put, I wouldn't base your career on it. Like if that no. happens, great, you know. But what you, what can you do is, you know, you hold on even five or 10%. If that idea takes off, that's, that's real money. And back to that word, right. you know, writers being squeezed and kind of like, revenue yeah. being a problem like that's a, a recurring revenue is a big you know that's the big the the, oh, the yes. goal the goal of the promised land you want to get into is having these checks come in for things that you you've done years ago and that's one way you can do that it's very hard for again unless you're an established writer to get that but you know some ideas if you're a writer you're gonna have a lot of ideas the first one that hits you're probably not gonna get the payday on but you'll get paid a lot for the second one and you hope that your second one is just as good or better than your first yes, one so yes. that's, that, yeah, yeah. That, that's what they say the first one forget it you just do it to get in the do door. it to get in the door exactly then, yeah, right then yeah. the second then the third I, it, it reminds me of that scene um i don't know i can't remember the title of the movie steve martin and the whole film he's like he's filming eddie murphy and others and so on and and then oh, he says yeah. i'm just waiting for fedex at the end of the movie you know and there's a slow motion there's the fedex guy delivering something to him so it's like kind of you know like the waiting for godot and they're comes FedEx. Right. I made it, you know, like yeah. FedEx delivery. So, well, yeah. uh, let me ask you just for fun. Uh, sure. What do you plan to do for the holidays in terms of what do you watch? What do you read? Do you just uh, sort of like relax and say, I'm not going to write anything anymore. The wake up is no, <laughs> I'm going to get up at like four o'clock in the morning. And I, I just hope that nothing will happen in all of the holidays, you know, that Bob Iger is not going to be fired <laughs> right. or something. You know, so, yeah. uh, so tell us, uh, what would you, um, uh, you know, in terms of your uh, content consuming, to use that word, what would you, what would be your the preferred mode? I'm just going to have, um, um, I don't know, a pizza delivery and uh, Netflix, <laughs> uh, or you go to the theater, or you go to Broadway, what is your... Yeah, what, what's the... What I <laughs> for the next question. I mean, you know, the, I love doing the wake up. I love doing what I'm doing, but you know, you are at the mercy of the the news cycle. And, you know, so I really, you know, I mean, next week, the week between Christmas and new year's should be, yeah. I say, I'll, you know, knock on wood, whatever. Now, uh, outside of the box office, you know, which will be, I'll, I will still report on and that, you know, I like doing that. That's not a, you know, a heavy lift for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll probably, I, I didn't plan too much and, you know, it's funny at the end of August, which is usually also a very quiet time. It was not, I was like, oh, I'm going to take the last week of August, you know, quote unquote off. And I wrote a newsletter every day and I was like, it, it, it just didn't, it just didn't stop because that was, you know, mm. big time of change kind of going from summer to fall this year, as, as you know, right. uh, and the business and it just didn't, people didn't take off, you know, they couldn't or whatever it might be. So I'm hoping this, as you say, there's no... <laughs> The yeah. head of uh, um, Amazon doesn't quick, change yeah. next week or whatever you want to, you know, whatever it is. So, uh, yeah, I have a few, you know, and I'm always someone, I also, in addition to the, the roundup stuff, I do some, you know, not longer analysis pieces, but things like that, that, you know, just have ideas jotted down that I want to just need time to just dive into more and do some more research on. So I'm hoping to maybe sketch out a few of those to see if there's something there, you know, just diving into the cable TV business and a few other, you know, sports and gambling, a few other topics that are, you know, not day to day stuff, but like driving larger trends that we're, we've been seeing these past few months. So uh, outside of that, see my family get out. I'm a big outdoors guy. Honestly, I don't like to spend a lot of time in front of a, a television, ironically enough. Yeah, so I'm, we have, uh, it's, yeah. it's de so. December, December daylight here in New York. So, you know, I take it, take every hour of sunlight I get until about four, four, four thirty, 30. And uh, so I will be outside for that time. And then maybe the evenings I'll start catching up on a few films. I'd like to see Babylon. I'd like to see, you know, the Fablemans I haven't seen yet. So there's a few films that I see, see that on, uh, in theaters. Uh, well, Babylon, I will. Fablemans, I can watch on you know premium video yeah. on demand now. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like I like going to the movies. Well, you know, especially when I have a relaxed time like that, where yeah. it's just I can go at one in the afternoon and do whatever you know that kind of vibe where I'm not uh, up against the schedule. I'll have to come back and write that night. I don't have things <laughs> looming over my head where I can go and enjoy it. Um, well, so we'll see. And uh, just 
my last question, I, I just read that uh, James Cameron said that, you know, uh, Avatar needs to make two billion in order to like, break even. Right. Uh, so what do you say to that? I mean, two billion, it's just, uh, um, anyway. Yeah, it's a famous line that he, I don't, I, he said it very intentionally, so I'm sure he, he meant to put that out into the universe. Uh, that was not from Disney or Fox or, you know, so that was from him. Um, and a lot of that, you know, no one knows how much, and he was saying that to be profitable as an endeavor for Disney, not to be like, he will be fine. So he's not losing, he's not, he's, you know, Lightstorm Entertainment, which is his company, is not losing money on Avatar, trust me. Uh, but the thing is, you know, no one knows what his quote unquote first dollar or first dollar gross is. So even once the production money is, which is rumored to be $375 million, the marketing is probably 150. So, you know, you're in for at least 500, uh, $550 million on this movie, uh, which generally speaking, you need to double, you know, so we'd have yep. to make over a million, over a billion, maybe 1.1 to even just kind of break even, but he's saying 2 billion, which means a lot of that money coming in the door, maybe going into his pocket, not Disney's. So to, for it to be profitable for Disney, it needs to hit two billion because of the big check that he's going to get of every dollar that comes in the door. That's my. I don't know that, that I have no see no facts of what his deal is, but I imagine he gets a pretty healthy cut of all, all the revenues there. Um, you know, the start was good. China is going to be a problem. Um, COVID really yep. de deflated. Uh, you know, they were hoping for one targeting one twenty one one hundred million. They upped it to one twenty on on Thursday as a projection. It came in at fifty seven. I think you know, COVID's really. And if you oh, read, yeah. some, I linked to some pieces in the New York Times. Just the anecdotes coming out of China right now is like nobody's going outside, no, no, uh, much less to a crowded a film, a movie theater, yeah. to a crowded movie theater, no less for that. So, it, yeah, that's I a saw, challenge. I saw images, like they say, you know, Beijing, you can actually see a street. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, it's, so it's just I'm a, sure that yeah, the theaters are a little challenged, but uh, you've also lost Russia since, like, you know, the, the films on Russia, which was not big, but that's part of it. Um, and remember, in China. Uh, studios only keep about 25% of the box office there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not, even when the movie, if the movie, movie made 400 million, Disney's only getting back a hundred million of that. So as much as it sounds big, you know, the math's yeah, a little, a little, yeah, yeah, a little fuzzy on that. So not as big of a deal per se, but that were counting, they were counting on that a bit. So, you know, we'll see. I don't know. I haven't, I didn't see too much. I mean, that was big in South Korea. I think Germany played big, you know, I haven't seen too many of the European numbers uh, as no, of yet, but. I haven't, I have to say, I haven't seen anything because I, I would think that Germany would be the biggest market in Europe. Uh, yeah, but the UK can uh, do really well Germany, for Germany, England, too, you know, yeah. maybe France a little bit, uh, but Germany probably, you know, the biggest, uh, uh, definitely the biggest market. So we'll, we'll see. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, maybe, uh, I mean, it, it, it will be interesting to see what happens and what happens with other movies. The long way ahead, long way and, ahead. You know, like, so sure. we are. Anyway, well, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time uh, that you spent with us. Uh, it is great. And I say us, it's only me here. But <laughs> I will share that with uh, uh, with uh, our CFEST audiences and uh, a lot of filmmakers among them who follow us. So some filmmakers here and some who are elsewhere. But, you know, I think this is good to have an insight from somebody who really follows the industry as you do. And uh, and maybe they will also start reading The Wake Up. Uh, uh, yeah, you can check it out nice. at the ankler, the ankler.com. You uh, so just sign up at, the, at that website. And you get the, the Wake Up every weekday in, uh, in your morning inbox with your coffee or tea or whoever, whatever you want to start your day with. You can do, you know, I know you're a coffee person, Vera. So, yes. uh, but whatever, any it's beverage of choice. It's for, and I do get up early. So there you are. I'm with you <laughs> <Exactly>. every day. <laughs> you know?